Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about new tools for Terra, 3D guns, deadly weapons for everyone. Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandakar, our geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Jay. Thank you for having me on your show. Always, always my pleasure. Well, we, you know, we've talked many times before about, about how technology has changed the battlefield. But in fact, it's changed everything. And we've talked about guns, but we have to catch up about guns because there are new guns, 3D guns, uh, and now the FGC-9, which is um, in many countries being created by many people and that gets by government regulations for the most part. So we should talk about that today. It's a sort of, a, it's an example of how technology moves ahead while you don't notice. And the other thing we should talk about, in fact, we should talk about it first, is the pager news in Lebanon. Uh, this is really interesting, and it's another example of creative technology by the Israelis. Why don't you tell us what happened there? Yeah, it was such a stunning uh, news bit that we got a few hours ago. When you see that these pages are exploding in supermarkets, in hands of the people, you know, they, they get injured. And what happens? This is pages exploding in the hands of the Hezbollah network. Now, Jay, uh, taking you back to what is a pager, it was a device that was used before the mobiles were invented. And whoever wanted to contact you with the pager had to call the operator and send you the message and you would get it beeped on your pager. You had no concept of replying through the pager. You had to then find another mobile device to connect or you receive the message. So there was no back and forth technology in this. It was just receiving of your messages. It was used as a relay of sorts. And what is the thing with this uh, pager, Jay? It uses radio frequency. It does not use the internet so what does that do for the pages it makes them untraceable on today's uh, grid of uh, internet surfing so what happens jay when um, uh, the israelis have you know masterminded this thing that uh, how your phone gets upgraded through uh, automatically upgraded that way they have sent a, a code of some sort which caused the all the pages it uh, sent a uh, message to all the pages, and it has gotten overheated and ultimately exploded. Now, Jay, in whose hands were these messages being relayed? They are the Hezbollah network. They were the ones who were receiving it. And one step further that has happened is Israel could not trace where the Hezbollah uh, uh, cadets were there. Now, after these pages explode or somebody is injured, there have been phone calls made to the emergency room uh, that somebody has been injured over here. So they have got the locations afterwards via internet, via satellite. So it's a double-pronged uh, sword that uh, they have used to attack the Hezbollah. And it's so perfect because this was a underground network like how uh, the Gaza network runs uh, through the tunnels. This was something which was used primitive technology used to their maximum advantage. So untraceable and hard to you know, combat. So Israel has countered it in their own primitive way. So I can wrap my mind around this. Nobody has pagers anymore. That was out of the, uh, the 80s. Uh, everybody has mobile phones. Why have a pager? Um, you can go get a mobile phone and everybody talks on mobile phones. If these guys are using pagers, it's not for legitimate purposes. It's for okay. command control. Um, and they use it only to uh, do command control um, to their terrorists. So Hezbollah is actually giving instructions to a lot of terrorists using the pagers. Okay, and, and Israel figures that out. Um, and Israel I mean, creates this uh, signal that um, effectively overheats the pager um, and the pager will either get very hot or blow up or go on fire. And, and so as a result, uh, just a few hours ago, um, 2,700 people were injured and, uh, and, a few, and a few were killed by the fires. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's really interesting. It, and it reminds me, doesn't it, 
of, of uh, the Stuxnet affair in Iran some years ago, when the Israelis deployed the Stuxnet virus into Iran, it was a brilliant move because it, the virus went around the world, but would only activate on the centrifuges in this nuclear plant in Iran. And as a result, they all overheated and they were effectively destroyed. So it set Iran back for years. Mm -hmm. They had to get rid of those centrifuges and get new ones. Cost them a lot of money, cost them a lot of time. So it's it's that same kind of creativity that's going that happened here. Um, what what by the way, what can Hezbollah do now? They have to give up that system, or it'll happen again because apparently every single person uh, who is in the Hezbollah command control environment um, got that upgraded um, explosive uh, version of the software, what, what can you do about that? I think you have to throw out the pagers. You have oh. to start again. And so that what, what Israel has done is they've completely undermined the, the, the command control arrangement, the system that Hezbollah was using. Yes, Jay, you're right about this. See, Gaza, in Gaza, the ha Hamas uses these radio, uh, radio frequencies still. Now, Hezbollah was using these pages. Now, like you said, it's redundant for them. They cannot use this. And plus, their network has been exposed. You see the pictures on the television screen. They show you supermarkets. They show pages in the hands of these women. Why are they carrying uh, the pages? Uh, they are being, uh, they are, there is a huge network of Hezbollah. There is, uh, you know, there are uh, messages to assemble in this point. Come as civilian shields. All these things, there is no, um, a Hezbollah network or a Hamas network just does not mean terrorists with black bands and uh, uh, guns in the hand. They also mean the civilians who support these terrorist organizations are willing to stand in front of um, um, the combating agencies as shields. As, uh, so they have to assemble at this point. Suppose there's a, a foreign agency like the... UN, which is coming for inspection, they have to come over there. So all these things are uh, in the network, Jay. And uh, they operate as an integrated uh, unit. So these pages were uh, like an expose on who is who in the network. Because half the time we can't believe. And like you said, nobody's using the pages now. So who are the, who are the users of this technology? Only the followers and of this or members of the Hezbollah. So let's talk about the FGC-9 now, another piece of technology that seems to be going around the world. Jay, like you gave me the acronym uh, full form, that it's a FCG is for the uh, fire gun control, nine. So besides the nine ammunition, the semi-automatic carbine, the 4.5 inch barrel and shooting at medium range, what makes this device, uh, this gun dangerous. It is that anyone who has $400 and a knowledge of firearms can make this at home. <laughs> so the concept of uh, ghost gun uh, machine is the thing that we are going to discuss today, Jay. And it's I commend you for the topic that you've brought up because it is a topic unknown to people and not in the mainstream news media because it is an underground operation like uh, it is they want to keep it as low as possible because it can be as widespread as it can be. Now, let's say it. Why? Because when commercial 3D printers hit the market, uh, people started getting creative with it. Uh, you could print out, you know, uh, whatever you wanted from your home. You could have kitchen uh, uh, stuff. You could have your machine spare parts. You could have, uh, you know, uh, anything. You name it and you have it. So what happened in 2013, a person known as Cody Wilson, he uses this 3D uh, technology to print out the first 3D gun known as the Liberator J. And this was the first pistol, uh, example of a 3D printed pistol. It, it's a plastic uh, uh, device. It, it looks like a toy. Mainly all these 3D guns look like toys. They're bright colored because they're made of plastic, but they're firearms. 
at the end of the day. So J, this uh, liberator which came out, it had the capacity to shoot 1.38 ACP cartridge. That was its limitation. And but it used to, uh, it had a tendency to explode because it's a uh, firearm and it's plastic and it lacked accuracy. These were the drawbacks and the setbacks of this, but it was still a gun. And uh, so uh, there was a court ruling that came out on April 27, 2021, 20, uh, that it would be, uh, you would be allowed to publish this online because many petitions came that please don't post this online because it gets available to everybody. Whoever has got access to the internet gets access to this. And this ruling, US court ruling, allowed you know, uh, swift downloading of this uh, manual, Jay, if you call it. And Jay, what's, what happened with this, that uh, these guns are untraceable because they don't have serial number. All you need is just a spool of filament and a 3D printer. That's it. Nothing else. And so, Jay, um, they're known as ghost firearms because the 3D printing happens uh, with uh, thermoplastic. And the thermoplastic goes, uh, you, you've seen a 3D printer, it goes into, it prints layer by layer, and the layers stick to each other. So the durability of this gun is depend, depending on your adhesive, which is being used. So it should not disintegrate. But um, the thermoplastic that comes in, uh, it it causes this uh, device to develop and it forms into a toy gun, but it can shoot. Again, I repeat. So what these uh, gun creators came up with, Jay, they came up with a hybrid gun system. The, um, the body grip and the stock were 3D printed with the plastic, but the, ba uh, the barrel, the nuts and the springs, they got from the spare guns. So that doesn't have a serial number. They are easily available. So now they had a more durable gun with more precision and uh, it was resembling a firearm more. They could experiment more. It started getting that they could shoot rounds of ammunition and uh, they started getting more dangerous. People started calling it a, uh, uh, what is it? Plastic Pandora's box and downloadable death. These were the terms being used in the media. But it has not stopped. It is available to each and every person who, who wants to see it on the internet can go for it. The, the issue was just to get a thermoplastic, which has got a melting point high enough not to, uh, with, uh, to, to withstand the pressure of the shooting gun. That was it, Jay. And um, the thing is that... Uh, with, because it could not be traced, and in the American First Amendment, your right to self-defense and freedom of expression gave this gun the notion of being uh, under creative expression. What about the accessibility to criminals? What about the accessibility to um, hurt, harm civilians? Or, or you know, uh, it can be used. We have had so many school shootings. We have we want gun control in a limited manner. There is a debate uh, back and forth on this. And now you have something which can be printed in your any part of your house. So and not only that, but um, you can share the printer. And the printer is entirely <laughs> above board. It's legal. You can buy them anywhere, a 3D printer, and then you can give it to your friend, uh, and he can give it to his friend. And, and before you know it, the actual cost of um, fabricating the, the gun the FGC-9, which I'm sure is the most popular one right now. Ghost mm. guns are out. What happens is that anyone interested in this kind of extremism, this kind of beyond the Second Amendment, if you will, um, terrorists, criminals, ideologues who are on the ultra-conservative side of things, uh, can can build these things. And they can build them quickly, and, and they can build lots of them, and they can um, bypass all the government regulations. And I was interested to see that um, the article about this in uh, Wikipedia is very notable. It goes on at some length describing exactly what the FGC-9 is, how you build it, what you need to build it. And then to my, to my great surprise, at the end of the article, there's like a dozen sources for the manual. 
This is after they say that in the UK, for example, possessing the manual or the gun is a crime. <clears throat> but yet this Wikipedia article um, you know, gives you access to those manuals, lots of access. There's also some uh, videos where you can see somebody firing the gun, and it fires just like an automatic or semi-automatic uh, weapon, like an assault weapon. It is an assault weapon. Uh, of course, the guy firing it had a mask on, so you never know exactly who that is. But it's got a history. It's got an ideology. It's got. It's a movement. This is a movement for guns that bypass the entire governmental system. And the governments involved, and there are dozens of countries in which these guns are being made, the governments haven't figured out how to stop them. The UK effort at uh, making the manual a, a crime, um, that I don't think that's had a whole lot of effect. And one of the countries in which these guns are being made is the US, but it doesn't stop there. It's an international movement. There are a number of countries in Europe and around the world uh, where people who want to do violence can create these guns. And in many places, they're using these guns. So we are really on top of a movement that is very, very destructive, goes beyond the Second, Second Amendment movement in this country. And um, I would predict that in the future, there'll be more of these guns. They'll be more sophisticated. <clears throat> they'll fire more quickly. Um, they'll be more um, invisible, like at an airport, um, and they will they will be in the hands of people who who shouldn't have guns at all, and yet they will proliferate. That that is my expectation here, and I base that on the fact uh, that they have moved very quickly over the past few years, and they are popular. And thanks to that court case you mentioned, uh, anybody, especially somebody who has sinister motivations can find out exactly how to do it and do it. And I do not give Wikipedia credit for this article because this, this Wikipedia has made itself the source of information and know-how about how to create them. Um, and this is, this, if you read this article in Wikipedia, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a manual itself. The article is a manual. So where is this going to go? What can government do about it, Rupmati? Hey, uh, it's a it's a uh, adverse technology based on a uh, positive technology. The three D printers came out as you being able to print out anything that you need, and from that came out this destructive uh, invention uh, of these creators to create guns out of it. Now it's become as easy for kids to do it as a school project. Or, oh, you know, uh, it's come down to that level of simplicity. And Jay, look up the uh, internet for this. This Cody Wilson, who we talk about, he is organizing these uh, rustic uh, competitions between these creators. Uh, now, there are just not content creators or video creators or photography creators. They are uh, gun creators. They come up with their versions of guns. You know, you have these... Um, car catchers which are made on the guns and uh, make them more attractive, more colorful, but they forget that they're exploding ammunition. And uh, they, they have an issue of the parts being stuck, the metal parts with the plastic parts. So, you know, you have them uh, helping each other and the firing ranges. So they are creating it as a small competition. Now it's just at the basic level because they are aiming, people are trying to aim at um, controlling them. But when this sport start get, getting into a competition, you know, you will see more people getting attracted to it. People get inquisitive out of curiosity. Mostly people get attracted to it. And when uh, a person is using a 3D printer for, say, his AutoCAD work or, or to create a model of uh, architecture, uh, but anything, anything, you know, the uses of a 3D printer are so many and so useful. Out of that, we've got this gun. And Jay, if a person gets angry in his school, uh, the school shootings that we uh, we deal with, it's a big problem that we deal with. Tomorrow, if he decides, like, I need to create a gun, it's as easy as ABC. There is no, how how can you control a mixer or blender at your at your house? 
a 3D printer is a plug and play uh, device. So how do we control that? And uh, without serial number, the ammunition is available easily. So we are in a kind of a fixed day. It's like something which AI might be destructive. We are seeing the destructive part of a 3D printer right here, right now. And uh, mm. 15 countries, the uh, guns have spread to 15. That is mm, the official number, but more than 15, I think. Yes, I agree, because it could mm. be spreading further every day today, for example. And, and it's spreading further in the U.S. So, um, you know, the ability of the government to regulate uh, assault rifles and the like, the ability of Congress to pass a bill that would regulate assault rifles is becoming irrelevant. Um, they haven't done it. And now this. Uh, so I, I suspect that we're going to see more of this. And as a result, you know, I, I think we could follow the notion that the more guns, the more gun mm -hmm. killings. And I think there will be more guns. I mean, as I recall, um, in, a, in a country of, uh, what, 330 million people, the U.S., um, there are more than that number of guns. And yeah. if we have these ghost guns, these uh, FGC-9s, um, it's going to be way more than that everywhere. And who knows how, you know, there'll be gun smuggling, but it'll be easy because it's not necessarily discernible. Um, on a on a TSA machine or on a, an X-ray device, but let me let me go to another element here. This is an example of technology putting weapons in the hands of the public. That's what it is. And if you think about um, other examples of that, you think about Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has been building drones that are lethal weapons. Ukraine is not, you know, especially in wartime, it's not really, you wouldn't expect Ukraine to have the technology to build a swarm, you know, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of, of lethal drones, but that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if their factories are very big, maybe it's done at home, home factory kind of thing. But they, they must have manuals, too. They must have techniques that allow them to build these drones. And if they can do it, anybody can do it, any place in the world. So I suggest to you that lethal drones, which have been developed, seriously developed, all in the last couple of years around the Ukraine war, um, are going also to be a, uh, a, a weapon a deadly weapon that the public can create using modern creative technology, don't you think? True, uh, Jay. This is so precise that you talk about. Uh, you know, we have a picture of uh, how the drones measure up, how huge they are. The Shahid drones, which uh, Shahid drones, which Iran is uh, supplying to Russia. So, uh, like you said, the drones become a technology which becomes accessible to anybody who wants to go and bomb a place. So we don't need sophisticated technology. Now it's uh, it's getting, uh, what do you say, bulk, bulk manufacturing going on. Uh, possibility of a bulk manufacturing for any combat uh, weapon J becomes dangerous. Because see, till now guns were used as deterrents to protect you for self-defense. When it becomes combat, when uh, the drones are used for surveillance, it's a different issue. When the drones are used for uh, suicide missions, like the drones go and act as a missile, that is the time when it becomes a problem. We have discussed it in our show on drones, Jay, that uh, uh, this technology went towards the destructive because uh, the ease of making it, the cost of making it, the cost of uh, uh, the that you save on a flight, uh, sorry, on a missile, uh, being launched from a uh, aircraft is much uh, less than you know is much more than what you can have with a drone get taking its own um, you know attack. So that's what's set this apart. Jay. The cost, cost effectiveness. So once you design the software, then you can deploy it to thousands and thousands, which is exactly what they did. Um, and so with drones you can create a, a, a cheap but lethal drone 
And hmm. then you can develop software that will fly those drones in a swarm, all these drones together, and attack somebody. And we we saw in the uh, Iran attack, it was mostly missiles, but it was also some drones on Israel a few months ago, um, that you, you need special defensive mechanisms to deal with a swarm. A swarm hmm. is hard to defend against. I think that's just one more point to say that if you wanted to conduct a war even using these weapons, the FGC-9 and um, and the uh, the drones coordinated with software, you could do it in your, your basement. You could do incredible damage. I worry about that because that has political implications. If somebody wanted to bring a government down um, and had access to these things, which isn't hard at all, um, they could do tremendous destruction um, to government institutions, to, for that matter, to government troops. Um, oh. So it's you could call it democratization of weapons. And in a way, it is, because everybody has access. I think it changes the world. We talked before about, about how the Ukraine war, and for that matter, the Israel-Hamas war, has changed the nature of war. Well, one of the, one of the big changes is the use of technology. And mm. this kind of technology will outlast the war. This is going to change things. This is going to be the asymmetrical means of warfare that you always talk about. This is the thing that we uh, look at. And Jay, uh, the overwhelming of you know these sophisticated iron dome systems and the anti-aircraft uh, missiles, a swarm of drones, cheap drones, will cause such a big problem. And uh, Jay, you remember in the Ukraine uh, attack in the um, uh, Kirks region uh, on Russia, they came, one drone was destroying a T-90 tank. So uh, it was uh, still that imbalance that tilted the um, uh, balance towards Ukraine. So you have cheap technology which can destroy your expensive uh, warfare equipment. So that creates uh, these tools of terror, Jay. And uh, Jay, one more point I would like to bring here that um, how these tools of terror uh, are cheap means used to disturb a government rather than bring down a government. I'll not use bring down a government. The Modi government in India, uh, like you know, we had colonial type trains till now, and now Modi has bought this uh, new uh, uh, super fast trains, the bullet trains, the accessibility, the facilities. He's upgrading the railway system in India because it's one of the largest industries of the world, the Indian railway. And Jay, the minority community, if mostly the minority community, they want to disturb or, you know, bring a bad name to Modi. What they are doing is they, uh, these cylinders, these heavy duty cylinders, these blocks of stone, they put those on the tracks to bring about a, a train crash, you know, train de derailment. Uh, so these, what I talk about, the petrol bombs which were created, you know, in the uh, Gaza Strip, these things which they get access to, which are cheaper, and they can destroy a, a very expensive, highly sophisticated system is what causes their, uh, their fervor to create disturbance is what is very, uh, uh, requires attention in the international system, Jay. Because uh, see for them, when you create and when you develop a technology, it requires so much effort. But to destroy, it doesn't need anything. It just requires bad intention, and uh, your uh, adrenaline rush, and you can you can really hurt a system at its core. So uh, you should have the coalition of uh, governments which work towards this combating these uh, asymmetrical models of destruction. They are very very necessary because to live in a highly demo uh, developed world with you know uh, humanity at its uh, highest concentration will require people to leave this kind of um, poking jay. It's very, very necessary. I don't know how to bring about this because small disturbances can cause a lot of uh, regime changes also. A student protest went up to regime change in Bangladesh. So we have to be careful what causes what. Yeah. 
Well, ultimately, I think um, extremism, terrorism, and destructive, destructive attacks, as are now possible with these weapons, mm. have, have to be dealt with. These mm. the steps that need to be taken have to be stronger and perhaps more draconian. For example, um, I think we need to regulate three D printers. Yes, you can't you can't have one. You can't buy one unless you identify yourself. Um, or maybe there are different kinds of three D printers, and maybe you change the materials. You know, from that that fiber you talked about to something else, so that you cannot make weapons with it. And the government has to step in, and the government has to be creative. And all the mm, components of these of these uh, F FGC um, nine weapons have to be regulated to the extent that government can regulate them. And that has to be strong regulation. I mean, I, I guess I commend the UK for making it illegal to possess either the manual or the gun. Hmm. I don't know if they've prosecuted anybody, but they need to. And they and they and that particular approach of making it illegal uh, to possess the manual or the gun, that has, that has to be considered everywhere because otherwise you have a million guns the same thing with drones you know you need certain kinds of materials and equipment to build them so if you want to stop the wrong people from creating those drones you have to take steps yeah jay uh, your point about 3d printers being regulated is such a valid and such a uh, nip in the uh, bud it is it is the right um uh, what do you say? Curtailment of this destructive uh, process, Jay, because it's on a roll. It's really on a roll. And uh, I'm sure <laughs> Al-Qaeda must be waiting for something to get their hands on a 3D printer so they don't need to uh, go and purchase guys. It's so easy. They've made it easy. Destruction requires just a dirty mind, nothing else. Uh, for them, technology is there. Everything is there. The accessibility is there. So like you said, when you cut the accessibility to this technology, that would go a long, long way to uh, help curtail this. Otherwise, it's going to just uh, burgeon into something which we cannot control. Imagine this going into a, into the civil wars in Africa. Imagine them being uh, one uh, printer being put and, you know, just it's like you, you've seen that clip where the uh, where there is uh, in in the forest <laughs> the gun lands in the hand of the monkey and he shoots haywire so it's like that if the the, uh, the this wrong technology falls in the wrong hands it's going to go helter skelter same thing uh, you go on a larger scale if the nuclear weapons are in the hands of a rogue state you're going to have destruction Exactly, a small gun, plastic gun in the hands of a criminal is going to bring destruction to human life. So the scale is different, the spectrum is large, but the mindset is what matters, the ideology is what matters, and the aim towards humanity has diverted to such a large extent, Jay. Human life has become so fickle that we have to <laughs> bring the value of uh, life and soul into this uh, whole international system, Jay, nobody really cares. It's just that for the moment, who I can destroy, when I can destroy. It's much easier to destroy things than to build them. And we are reminded of that on a regular basis. A great topic, a great discussion. We'll have to follow it going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jay. Aloha, Jay.